Hello there. Welcome to another session on this channel. I came across this picture when I was preparing for this topic. And at one look, the picture is beautiful. It encompasses the entire beauty of the sport. Male testosterone pumping and all that action is all visible in that one picture. But if you have a closer look at this specific point, you see there, that is a nasty injury. And I definitely do not want to be in that person's shoes. So with that scenario in mind, let us come to the topic of discussion today. So our topic for the day is, and the topic will be discussed under the following headings. Right, so coming to the knee joint. It is a very complex joint. It is a compound joint. It is a condylar joint. It is of the synovial variety and it is also a modified type of hinge joint. So if I say all of that in one single sentence, the knee joint is a compound, complex, condylar, synovial, modified hinge joint. The bones involved in the formation of the knee joint are, you have the femur, then you have the tibia, and you also have the patella. Please remember, the fibula does not, I repeat, the fibula does not take part in the formation of the knee joint. Although you might see it in that vicinity, the fibula does not take part in the formation of knee joint. It's a commonly asked question to the students during the viva. So now that we've seen the bones which take part in the formation of the knee joint, let us be a bit more specific as to which the articular surfaces are that contribute to the formation of the knee joint. So in the case of the femur, it is basically the anterior, the inferior, and the posterior aspects of the condyles. Then in the case of the patella, it is the posterior surface. This is the anterior surface of the patella. It is the posterior surface of the patella. And in the case of the tibia, it is the upper end. And the upper end, this is the condylar surfaces. It is the condylar surface. That is the medial condylar surface and the lateral condylar surface that takes part in the formation of the knee joint. So you have the lower end of the femur, the upper end of the tibia and the posterior aspect of the patella. These are the articular surfaces that contribute to the formation of the knee joint. So coming to the ligaments of the knee joint, so let us look at the first one that is the capsular ligament. So capsular ligament is a fibrous sac that envelops around the knee joint. Attachment wise it has got a femoral attachment and a tibial attachment. In both the cases the line of attachment is around half to around one centimeter away or beyond the articular margins. If you look at the attachment of the femoral aspect, uh, from the diagram it is clear, on the, ante on the anterior aspect it is deficient, that is for the passage of the suprapetella bursa. On the posterior aspect you can see it is attached along the intercondylar line. On the lateral aspect it encloses the origin of the popliteus muscle. If you look at the attachment of the tibia, again on the anterior aspect you can see that it is attached on the anterior surface of the triangular so triangular like area of the tibia and it blends with the ligamentum patella. On the posterior aspect of the tibia, if you see, you can see it is attached along the intercondylar area but there is a small gap or you can see there is a small deficiency that is for the passage of the tendon of the popliteus muscle. So coming to the synovial membrane, the synovial membrane lines the inner aspect of the fibrous capsule and also the part of the bones that are within the capsule but it seizes at the periphery of the margins of the cartilage, that is the medial and lateral menisci. From the diagram you can see that it continues above as the suprapetella bursa above which I talked in the uh, section of the capsular uh, ligament. You can see this intervening between the quadriceps femurs on the anterior aspect and the lower end of the femur on the posterior aspect. It is held in position at the top by the help of the attachment of the articular gym. Now, the lower aspect is seen as a triangular area that is the infra patella fold and the apex of this is attached to the intercondylar area of the femur and the base is directed towards the patella. The lateral margin of the infra patella fold is free and it contains fibro fatty tissue. Now derived from the tendon of the quadriceps femoris we have the ligamentum patellae. The attachment wise it is attached from the apex of the patella above to the superior aspect of the tibial fibrosity below. Length in the breadth is around 7.5 cm into 2.5 cm and it is related to the subcutaneous and deep infrapetella bursa 
and also to the infrapetella pad of fat. Now coming to the collateral ligaments. There are two of them. The tibial collateral ligament and the fibular collateral ligament. The tibial collateral ligament being on the medial side it is also called medial collateral ligament. The fibular collateral ligament being on the lateral aspect it is also called lateral collateral ligament. So the tibial collateral ligament as such you can see the superior attachment as it is visible from the diagram over here is from the medial epicondyle of the femur. It has got two parts, a superficial part and a deep part. The superficial part is band like whereas the deep part is triangular in shape. The superficial part extends down, attaches onto the medial condyle of the tibia and also the upper medial margin of the shaft of the tibia. The deep part attaches or blends with the fibrous capsule as such and attaches onto the medial meniscus. The superficial part, as you can see, is related to three muscles, sartorius, gracilis and semi-tendinosus, whereas the interval between the deep part and the superficial part from the diagram you can see there is presence of the inferior medial genicular vessels and nerves and also a part of the semi-membranosus muscle. Now when we talk about the fibular collateral ligament which is also called the lateral collateral ligament we can see from the diagram that the attachment superiorly is from the lateral epicondyle of the femur whereas inferiorly it is attached to the head of the fibula. It is separated from the meniscus by the tendon of the puppeteers as the lateral meniscus and it is not adherent to the capsule as it is separated by the presence of the inferior lateral genicular vessels and nerves. From the diagram you can also see around the outer aspect it is embraced by the tendon of the biceps femoris. Now we shall discuss about two ligaments which cross each other like the letter X. Hence they are given the name cruciate ligaments. So there are two of them. So that is one is the anterior, the other one is the posterior. And the names anterior and posterior are given depending on their attachment to the upper surface of the tibia, more specifically the intercondylar area of the tibia. So the anterior cruciate ligament, as you can see in the diagram over here, is attached between the two anterior horns of the medial and lateral meniscus. It travels upwards, backwards and laterally. So it is obviously going to the lateral condyle of the femur, but it attaches to the medial surface of the lateral condyle of the femur. Now the posterior cruciate ligament, again as you can see in the diagram over here, it is attached posteriorly behind both the horns of the posterior horns of the lateral and medial menisci. It again travels upwards or superior as obvious and this time the posterior uh, cruciate ligament travels anteriorly and medially. So it is going towards the medial contour of the femur but it attaches on the lateral surface of the medial condyle. Both these ligaments are concerned with the anteroposterior stability of the knee joint. That is very important to note. And they are taught during extremes of flexion and extension. In fact, the anterior cruciate ligament is taught during extremes of extension that the, it is the anterior cruciate ligament which acts as the axis on which the femur will medially or laterally rotate in the case of the locking and unlocking of the knee joint. So coming to the menisci. So there are two menis uh, menisci. One is the lateral meniscus, one is the medial meniscus. So when I say menisci, the number that should come to your mind is see why do I say that uh, this number should come to your mind see uh, it is easy to remember there are two menisci lateral meniscus medial meniscus each meniscus has two ends or two horns an anterior horn and a posterior horn each meniscus has two borders one is the inner border that is thin and outer border that is thick and each menisci has two surfaces. One is the superior surface which is in relationship with the femoral condyles and the other one is the inferior surface which is in relationship with the tibia. Now what are the functions of menisci as such? The menisci basically what happens is it increases the concavity of the tibia in which the femoral condyles move during the different movements. Then it also acts as a cushion or a shock absorber. Also helps in lubrication of the knee joint. It helps the superior surface of the tibia to accommodate to the varying 
uh, movements of the um, femoral condyles. Now the menisci as you can see from the diagram over here, the medial one is roughly C shaped whereas the lateral one is roughly circular. The medial one is in close relationship with the tibial condyle, sorry, with the tibial collateral ligament and the coronal ligament. The lateral one is in close relationship with the popliteus. The medial one, since it is more in relationship with the, or it is bound firmly to the tibial collateral ligament, is more prone to injury, whereas the lateral one is less prone to injury. One important thing to note over here is that it is these menisci which divide the joint cavity into menisco-femoral superiorly and menisco-tibial inferiorly. Menisco-femoral is concerned with flexion extension whereas menisco-tibial is concerned with the rotatory movements of the knee joint. Now let's talk about a ligament that runs on the popliteal aspect of the knee joint that is on the posterior aspect and it runs in oblique fashion hence the name oblique popliteal ligament. This is basically an expansion of the tendon or the semimembranosus muscle and what happens is it runs from the tibia to the femur that is upwards and laterally and it is in close relationship with the posterior aspect in relationship with the uh, popliteal artery it forms the floor of the popliteal fossa it is pierced by the middle genicular vessels and nerves and also by a branch that is the genicular branch of the posterior division of the obturator nerve now let us talk about a Y-shaped band or Y-shaped ligament that is the arcuate ligament. So since it is Y-shaped it has to have a stem and two bands. So the Y, the stem of the Y in this case is attached to the styloid process of the fibula. Then it has got a posterior band and an anterior band. To keep things simple just remember the posterior band is attached to the tibia whereas the anterior band is attached to the femur. In both cases, it is attached to the lateral condyle. So that would be the lateral condyle of the tibia and the other one would be the lateral condyle of the femur. So now coming to another ligament where the direction of the orientation itself speaks about the name of the ligament. So that is the transverse ligament. And as you can see from the diagram over here, it is attached to the anterior ends of the medial and lateral meniscus. It is considered to be present in only about 40% of the population. Coming to another uh, ligament that is the coronal ligament. The coronal ligament as you can see again in the diagram over here, it helps in attachment or stabilization of the menisci on the peripheral aspect towards the tibia. So coming to the movements of the knee joint. So the movements of the knee joint, what are the movements possible over there? They are flexion, extension, mid rotation and at rotation. Flexion and extension are considered as the main movements whereas medial rotation and lateral rotation are considered to be adjunct or conjunct movements. Now where does this occur? The flexion and extension takes place in the menisco femoral compartment of the knee joint whereas the medial rotation and lateral rotation takes place in the menisco tibial compartment of the knee joint. The flexion is considered to be when the posterior aspect of the thigh and the posterior aspect of the leg come close to each other. So the angle formed over there will reduce. Whereas in extension, that angle increases. As far as medial rotation and lateral rotation is concerned, conjunct is otherwise also called automatic rotation. It happens automatically during flexion and extension. Whereas adjunct rotation is basically considered to happen when the knee is already in a semi-flex position. So these are in simple terms the movements which are possible at the knee joint. So now that we have seen what the movements of the knee joint are, let us see what are the muscles that help in bringing about these movements. So as far as extension is concerned, it has to be the muscles on the anterior of thigh. So that would be quadriceps. As far as flexion is concerned, we saw in the case of the unlocking of the knee joint, it is initiated by the popliteus muscle. Then of course it has to be the muscles on the posterior aspect of the knee. Of the knee. So that would be the semitendinosus, the semimembranosus, the biceps femoris, and also there is assistance from the gracilis. What about medial rotation? As far as medial rotation is concerned, it has to be the muscles on the medial border of the popliteal fossa. So there you have semimembranosus and semitendinosus. What about the lateral rotation? As far as lateral rotation is concerned, again the muscle on the lateral border, so as the biceps femoris. So these are the muscles that bring about the movements of the knee joint. 
So let us try to understand what is unlocking and locking of the knee from a common prank that occurs among friends. Consider this situation. You are talking to your friend in front of you. You are oblivious of anything that is going on around. You got your, you are standing erect, you have got your arms crossed across your chest and you are blabbering away about the weather, the people in power, the economic crisis and suddenly you jerk back. It takes a few seconds for you to realize and then you realize it is your friend who has knocked you off from behind. Basically what they do is they bend their knees and they hit you on the posterior aspect of the knee. By the time you realize who did this, they would have kept a fair amount of distance between you and them so that you, do, you cannot chase them. The state in which your knee was as you were blabbering to the front in front of you, that is the lock knee and the moment the other front hits your knee from behind, that is unlocking of the knee joint. I hope this example uh, helps you to understand what is lock knee and what is an unlock knee. Okay, so now with the help of the femur and the tibia, I will try to explain in simple terms the locking and unlocking mechanism of the knee joint. So this is the lower end of the femur and this is the upper end of the tibia. So this would be the formation of the knee joint. Of course you have to have the patella in front but for this we are not using the patella. So with the foot on the ground which is shown by the position of the tibia, this should be flexion and this should be extension. Okay. So now I will show that again. So this is the flexed knee. Now what happens is as the knee comes into extension, the femur slightly rotates medially. So there is a medial, there is a rotation in the medial direction, a small twist. That is where it finally locks the knee joint. Whereas in the case of extension, since it is locked, it has to unlock. So to unlock there is a slight lateral rotation first and then it extends. So the medial rotation of the femur on the tibia towards the end of extension is where it locks whereas the lateral rotation of the femur on the tibia unlocking it following which there is flexion. Is it clear? So I hope in simple terms you would have understood locking of the knee joint and unlocking of the knee joint. The muscle that brings about locking of the knee joint is a quadriceps femoris whereas the muscle that brings about the unlocking of the knee joint is the popliteus muscle. I hope in simple terms I have been able to make it clear. Of course there are more details to cover in this but at a bare minimum level I think this should be sufficient to understand locking and unlocking of the knee joint. So coming to the relations of the knee joint. Relations of the knee joint in simple terms can be discussed as follows that is relations anteriorly and posteriorly then anteriorly on the medial and lateral aspect posteriorly on the medial and lateral aspect. Anteriorly you have the tendons of tendon of the quadriceps femoris. Posteriorly is simple you just have to remember the contents of the popliteal fossa. So you have the popliteal artery, popliteal vein, tibial nerve, the popliteal part of fat over there. Anterolaterally it is the lateral patella retinacula. Anteromedially it is the medial patella retinacula. If you look on the posterior aspect medially Again, you just have to remember the boundary of the popliteal fossa on the medial aspect. So you have the uh, semitendinosus and the semimembranosus. Along with that, you also have sartorius and the gracilis. Plus, you have the medial head of the gastrocnemius. If you look at the posterolateral aspect, again, the boundary of the uh, popliteal fossa. So you have the uh, biceps femoris. Plus, you also have the plantaris tendon. And along with that you also have the presence of the common peroneal nerve. And you also have the lateral head of the gastrocnemius that is seen on the postural aspect of the knee joint. So if you look at all of these, these are the relations of the knee joint which has schematically been represented in the diagram that is shown over here. So now let us look at what are the contributing factors for the stability of the knee joint. So the factors that contribute to the stability are as follows. First one, you have the presence of the crochet ligaments, that is the anterior and the posterior crochet ligaments. Like I told in that section, they maintain the anteroposterior stability of the knee joint, that is very important. Then the side to side stability or the medial to lateral and lateral to medial stability is maintained by the presence of the collateral ligaments, that is the tibial and the fibula collateral ligaments. Then the muscles and the tendons around the knee joint also provide stability for the knee joint. 
Then in the case of a flex knee or semi flex knee, it is the iliotibial tract that helps in maintaining the stability of the knee joint. So these are in short the factors that help the maintenance of the stability right. of the so by now you have understood that the knee joint has a lot of moments and there are plenty of attachments around it. Okay? So now we come to the next section that is the bursae of the knee joint. So what are bursae? Bursa for singular, bursae for plural. So bursae or bursa basically they are fluid filled sacs that are present around the knee joint, especially around the joints, especially moving parts of the joints. Why? So that they reduce friction. Okay? So as far as the knee joint is concerned, the bursae are as follows. There are four on the anterior aspect, four laterally and four or three on the middle aspect. So all in all you have, you have around 12 bursae related to the knee joint. That shows how complex the joint is and the um, wide variety of movements. Although you say flexion, extension, medial rotation, lateral rotation, you know the amount of times a person sits up, stands up, walks around, all that. So to avoid friction and problems in those areas, we have bursae. So on the anterior aspect, if you see, the bursae are as follows. So we've seen one previously, that is the suprapetella bursa, as the name suggests, above the petella. Okay, that was previously talked about. Then you have the pre-petella bursa. As the name suggests, pre-petella, in front of the petella. So that means this bursa is present between the skin and the petella. Then you have infra-petella bursa. That means below the petella. That too, it is subcutaneous. The other one is deep. So subcutaneous would mean below the skin. So this bursa is present between the skin and the attachment or lower attachment of the ligamentum petellae. And the deep uh, bursa is seen between the attachment of the ligamentum patellae and the upper anterior aspect of the tibia. So these are the four bursae that we see on the anterior aspect of the knee joint. So now let's come to the bursa around the lateral aspect of the knee joint. So let's break it down and make it a little more simple. So first thing on the lateral aspect you know there is a muscle that is the gastrocnemius. You have the lateral head of the gastrocnemius. So first bursa to remember is the one between the lateral head of the gastrocnemius and the capsule of the knee joint. Okay. The second and the third, let us take the common factor in both. That is the fibula collateral ligament. So second one will be the bursa between the fibula collateral ligament and the tendon of the biceps femoris. The four, third one will be the bursa between the fibula collateral ligament and the tendon of the popliteus. Simple. Now for the fourth one, let's take the popliteus again. So that would be the fourth one would be the bursa that is present between the popliteus and the lateral aspect of the tibia. So these are the four bursae in relationship with the lateral aspect of the knee joint. So now when we come to discuss the medial aspect, the bursae around the medial aspect, let us apply the same principles that we applied on the lateral aspect. In the lateral aspect, the first one we talked about was the um, bursa between the lateral head of the gastrocnemius and the capsule. Same thing over here. The only thing is we make it medial head of the gastrocnemius. So first one will be between the medial head of the gastrocnemius and the capsule of the knee joint. Over there, in the lateral aspect, we, in the second and third one, we picked up a common factor. That was the fibula collateral ligament. In the medial aspect, we do the same, only with a certain twist. We pick up the common factor which is the superficial part of the tibial collateral ligament. So the second bursa on the medial aspect will be the bursa between the superficial part of the tibial collateral ligament and the muscles on the outside, SGS, which we have talked about before, semitendinosus, gracilis and sartorius. And the third one obviously is very simple, it has to be the bursa between the superficial and the deep part of the uh, tibial collateral ligament. The fourth one, which the authors say may or may not be there, the bursa between the semimembranosus and the medial aspect of the tibia or the medial content of the tibia. So if you can just remember uh, by applying the same principle that you applied over there, the sudden twist, you can remember the bursae that are present between the lateral aspect of the uh, knee joint and the medial aspect of the knee joint. So coming to the arterial supply of the knee joint, 
the knee joint receives a rich arterial network by the anastomosis that is seen around the knee joint the main blood supply if i may say so is from the genicular branches of the popliteal artery there are five of them two above two below and one behind the joint so the superior medial and lateral genicular branches are seen on the superior aspect of the condyles of the femur as you can see in the schematic representation over here the inferior medial and lateral genicular branches are seen along the tibia the middle genicular branch however is not visible in the diagram because it is behind the knee joint then there is also contribution from the superior aspect there is the contribution from the femoral artery and from the lateral circumflex femur there is also contribution from the inferior aspect two recurrent branches from the anterior tibial and one branch from the posterior tibial you can also see there is transverse anastomosis between the superior genicular arteries and the inferior genicular arteries the uh, rich supply that is seen around the knee joint is evident because during extreme flexion there can be kinking of the popliteal artery so what happens is the blood flow becomes sluggish to compensate for this the blood supply is maintained by the collateral circulation around the knee joint so if you look at the nerve supply of the knee joint i would recommend the easy way to remember is three letters f s and o femoral sciatic and operator nerves another easy way to remember that is if you look if you remember the nerve supply of the three compartments of the thigh the anterior compartment is by the femoral nerve the medial by the operator nerve and the posterior one is by the sciatic nerve so extend those nerves down to the knee the only catch over there is the sciatic nerve as you know divides into two components one is the tibial nerve other one is the common peroneal nerve so the exact nerve supply of the knee joint would be three branches from the femoral three branches from the tibial three branches from the common peroneal and one branch from the posterior division of the operator nerve so in total there are 10 nerves that supply the knee joint so now let us look at some of the clinical scenarios that are related with the knee joint the first one that we will look upon is the osteoarthritis that is something that is very common commonly seen it is basically what happens is due to continuous wear and tear as the knee being a weight bearing joint the patient complains of pain restricted movement and sometimes even grating sound and what happens is the x ray usually reveals the presence of osteophytes at certain times you have also seen people where the um, knees are abnormally close to each other and certain cases where the knees are abnormally far away from each other so in the cases where the knees are abnormally close to each other the name that they give that condition is called genu valgum or knock knee as the knees are almost knocking each other and the other one where the knees are abnormally far away or far apart from each other the name they give that is given for that condition is genu varum or bow knees a trick to remember this condition thing is because during the examination when we ask the students which is which they are often confused so when the knees are close to each other what you should remember is they are stuck to each other using gum so there you have genu valgum this is just a trick for students to remember during the exam now coming to another injury that is commonly talked about meniscal tears that is mainly common that is mainly talked about in sports people especially footballers it is usually seen associated with forceful abduction and rotation so what happens is uh, if the patient complains of pain during lateral rotation of the tibia on the femur that means it is it is considered to be indicative of lateral meniscal tear whereas if the patient complains of pain during medial rotation of the tibia on the femur that is suggestive of medial meniscal tear and uh, among these two medial meniscal tear is more common one of the reasons being due to the wide uh, range of movement that is possible on the medial aspect the second reason being during the movements if you remember from the uh, section of the ligaments when i talked about over there the popliteus is in close relationship with the lateral meniscus so the popliteus will pull the posterior horn of the lateral meniscus backwards preventing it from injury between the articular surfaces and what happens is another commonly seen thing is that the medial meniscal injury is commonly associated with injury to the anterior cruciate ligament as well as the tibial collateral ligament so these three occur together because of this very reason they are often called the unhappy triad that is the anterior cruciate ligament 
the uh, tibial collateral ligament and the medial meniscus together they are often referred to as the unhappy triad. Now in certain cases to check the integrity of the cruciate ligaments the drawer test is done. The patient is told to lie down flat and the hips are flexed as well as the knees are flexed and the examiner holds the ankle and what happens is they pull the tibia towards them. If the tibia moves forward excessively then that indicates that the drawer sign is present and an anterior drawer sign is indicative of the injury of the anterior cruciate ligament. Now and the examiner intends to check the posterior cruciate ligament. So again the uh, patient's leg is held by the ankle and the examiner pushes the tibia and in this case if the tibia moves backward excessively that means the posterior drawer sign is present and a posterior drawer sign is indicative of the injury to the posterior cruciate ligament. A trick to remember this is that to which direction the drawer sign is present it is that cruciate ligament that is injured. If the knee joint happens to be severely damaged following osteoarthritis, then an option available is the knee replacement. So the artificial knee contains actually plastic and metallic components. And what happens is the after removal of the defective area, the artificial knee is cemented to the uh, femoral and tibial ends. So this um, combination of plastic and metal mainly what uh, it is done so because it helps to mimic the cartilage on cartilage movement, the smoothness of that movement and it has provided good results in the case of low demand people, low demand people meaning people who live a comparatively sedentary lifestyle. In the case of high demand people what happens is that is the sports personalities what happens is the bone cement junctions might break down and the artificial knee joint might loosen. However, um, advancements in bioengineering and surgical techniques have provided better results for these high demand personalities. Endoscopic visualization of the knee joint cavity with minimal disruption of the tissue. In simple terms, arthroscopy. The arthroscope along with that two or three candy will be inserted into the cavity through small incisions uh, which are called portals. Through these portals specialized instruments are inser inserted so that the Procedures can take place smoothly and uh, there is either excision or trimming or even shaping of the structures on in the, in the cavity of the knee joint. In, you can also do uh, ligament repair and ligament replacement through arthroscopy. Zell anesthesia is the preferred mode, although in certain cases local or regional anesthesia has also been seen to suffice. Prepetella bursitis, which is because of the inflammation of the prepetella bursa which results because of chronic uh, rubbing of the knee on hard surfaces which results in uh, inflammation of the bursa along with fluid accumulation and distinction of the bursa over there has been previously referred to as housemaid's knee although now it is also commonly seen among people who are concerned with hardwood flooring where they do the work without using proper knee pads in the case of subcutaneous infrapetella bursitis, there is inflammation of the bursa over there because of constant friction of the tibial tuberosity. This was previously referred to as the clergyman's knee because of uh, constant genuflecting. However, it is now commonly seen among roof tilers who again, like in the, in the previous case, do not use proper knee pads during their work. Alright then, so coming to the last part, the Herculean task of summarizing the knee joint. So let us see what we saw in the knee joint. So at first we had an introduction as to what the joint is. Then we saw the classification of the knee joint, the different ways in which the knee joint can be classified. Then we saw the bones involved and the articular surface of those bones that participate in the formation of the knee joint. Then what we saw were the ligaments of the knee joint. There's an entire list of ligaments that you have to go through. Following that, we saw what the movements of the knee joint were. That is uh, flexion, extension, medial rotation and lateral rotation. Then we saw the muscles which were responsible for those movements. After that, what we saw was we tried to understand locking and unlocking of the knee joint 
by common prank that occurs among friends. Then I have tried to demonstrate the same thing with the help of the tibia and the femur. Then we came to the relations of the knee joint, the anterior, posterior, then anterolateral, posterolateral, anteromedial, posteromedial relations of the knee joint. Following that we saw the bursae that were present around the knee joint. Then we saw the, the, the bursae, there, there are around 12 of them, ante, uh, anterior, middle and lateral, 4, 4, 4 each. Then we saw the factors which are responsible for the stability of the knee joint. After that we came to the copious blood supply of the knee joint. Um, the diagram, if you remember over, over there, from the superior aspect, the inferior aspect, then the anastomosis, the genital arteries, all that. Then we came to the nerve supply of the knee joint. That's around 10 nerves supplying the knee joint. And finally, we've covered a few of the clinical aspects, which includes a few diseases and a few uh, testing modalities of the knee joint. So that, in short, I could say, is the summary of the knee joint. As always, please do view, share and like our videos. Please do subscribe to the channel if you have not done so far. Please do leave your valuable opinions in the comment section below. Until we meet again next time, stay safe, keep smiling and God bless.